So like so many of you here today, I fundamentally believe that stories can shape individual lives and can shape whole societies, and that's why I care so much about them. And I've really seen that play out in the um, story of my own family. My great-grandfather was from this part of the world. He was from Poland, actually. And as a Jew living in Poland in the first part of the 20th century, he deeply was raised to live out the stories of the Old Testament in a way that um, I'm not familiar with and I can hardly imagine from where I stand today. But it was his belief and practice of these old stories that set him apart from the larger community that he lived in and defined his whole life. But as he came of age, he started hearing murmurings of a different story, a story from across the seas of opportunity and modernity in America. And so he left his family behind and came to the United States. And his family would be, stay behind in Poland as World War II broke out. But he came to the United States hoping, it, hoping to live a different story, a story of the American dream. He died very poor, but his son, my grandfather, grew up completely immersed in this story that anybody who had a dream and would work hard could grow and be somebody. And he lived that story until he died this year. Um, he became a t-shirt printer in New York and pulled himself from poverty to being a, a successful entrepreneur. But his children began living a very different story than him or, his, or their grandfather. My mother came of age during the Vietnam War, when suddenly that great American story stopped making sense. And that's one of the great features of our times, where once stories would last for generations, now they come up and they disappear almost as quickly. She rejected that American dream story and began to work in a new story, that, that hippie story of the 1960s, that, that a great new society was possible, that we could move beyond violence, that humans could consciously evolve, and that became to define her life. Now, that story was already crumbling by the time I was coming of age in the 1980s, and that great society sort of was not coming to be, and it was becoming derided in that more materialistic age where I was, where I was raised. And I began looking for stories that would matter to me and that I could live by. I'm not sure I've found all those stories yet, but what it drove me to was to study stories themselves. I saw how important it was, how it defined the lives of my ancestors and my own parents. And I've studied stories because I so believe that they can form our identity and change the world at a time where world change is one of the most important things that we can possibly engage in. And so I'm a marketer and an advertiser who tries to put out new stories for social good. And I want to talk to you a little bit about today how we can harness these stories if you run an organization, if you manage a brand, how you can push for change in the world by telling better stories. So how does this work? Well, I just talked to you guys a little bit about great meaning stories. And all societies and cultures that anthropologists have ever studied have had these great meaning stories that hold them together. These stories tell us who we are and what matters and what doesn't. These stories are the reason that children sit on their parents' knees as if programmed and say, tell me a story, tell me a story. They want to know who our kind of people are. And these great stories are called myths. Now, in our modern world, where stories are kind of... Uh, left behind for facts and figures and data, myths has come to mean a lie, right? We laugh at myths. But anthropologists say that all societies across all times have used myths to tell them who they are. And a myth combines four things. First, it explains how the world works. It tells you what's happening around you. Second, it doesn't just say, here's the world, so you better just, just observe it and admire it. It says, no, here's your place in the world as a result. It gives us meaning tells us who we are. Story. These myths don't take place in our neighbor's backyard or in our bathroom or some place that we can easily access. They take place long ago and far away. They access the part of our minds that are symbolic and dreamlike. And then rituals. They give us a way to live that story out in our own lives. So all cultures that we know of have shared certain myths and stories. Now here's the myth that drove um, my great-grandfather's life. It's the story of Genesis, is one of the great myths that he lived by. And remember, when I say a myth, I don't mean it's not true. I mean it's a story that drives people's identity and meaning. It organizes their lives, right? So explanation. God created the world in seven days. I'm going to go quickly through this, obviously. It's a quite a rich story. Meaning, if he could do it in seven days, I can surely explain it in 30 seconds. Meaning, it doesn't just tell us that God did it. It tells us this is, this is God's world. And so we should live in obedience to him. Story. It takes place long ago and far away. In fact, so long ago and far away, it's in a garden that we can never see or return to. It makes it sacred, right? And then ritual. There are hundreds of ways to live out this story in your own life. That's what the story is for, to tell you how to live. Now, in the 20th century, 
with all that was changing and the great wars that occurred and modernity and technology, these stories started to crumble. And Carl Jung, the great psychologist, feared that we might become the first global society to have no common myths. We entered a time of what a lot of anthropologists were calling a myth gap, where stories didn't make sense. And actually, many of them felt that the wars that were occurring were as a result of the fact that we were a people without myths. But I think that as our old myths started to crumble, new myths really started coming up. But they weren't told by our politicians or by our holy men. They were told by our marketers. So in the 1950s, marketers stopped talking so much about the facts and the features of their product. They started telling stories. And Madison Avenue discovered this ability to move people by creating these new myths, right? So let's go quickly through this other Genesis story, the, the story of the Marlboro Man. So what was being birthed at the time was a new type of cigarette. The cigarette had a filter on it, which made it a ladies' product. I don't know if you know that, but in the, back in the day, a man would never be caught dead holding a filtered cigarette. Now, instead of talking about how it was healthy or tastes better, or doing any of that, they simply put up this image of the Marlboro Man. Now, this guy is dead, and yes, he did die of lung cancer, but he is still the most famous pitch man of all time across the world, and he never uttered a single word. Wow, that is magic, right? How'd they do it? They created a new myth. Explanation, right? Filtered cigarettes are now for men. The world works a different way. Meaning, if you still to this day see someone pull out a pack of Marlboro Reds and smoke it, you assign to them an identity. They assign themselves an identity. It's not just a cigarette. It's a whole way of being, right? So you look at this image, you see that cigarette, you say, that could be me too. Story. People don't walk by these billboards and say, hey, that guy's not real. Don't believe that ad. We know he's not real. It's a story, but we love it anyway. And then ritual. Is there any way to live this story out in your own life? Yeah, of course. You go to the store and buy a pack of cigarettes. So marketers became our modern myth makers for better or for worse. Now, in the beginning, it was really for worse. So, like all storytellers, marketers use a kind of story formula. And they use a pretty common story formula that we probably all know. It's the story of the damsel in distress. So what'd they do? They would say, okay, there's a damsel in distress. That's you guys. Um, there's a problem. The world is kind of scary. And then there's a hero. That's us. If you consume our product, you're going to be just fine. So how does this work? Here's one of the earliest examples. I don't know if you guys know what halitosis is. Um, people didn't know what halitosis is when this ad came out. It means bad breath. Now, this is Sad Edna. She's one of the first great storytelling breakthroughs in marketing. And she is 30 years old, and she's still not married. So that was a, that was a spinster back then. And it says that bad breath makes you unpopular. It also goes on to say that you can never know if you have bad breath and people will never tell you, so you better use this product. And through this advertisement, they introduced Listerine to the market, which had never existed before, but became a multi-billion dollar part of the health industry that exploded thanks to marketing like this, right? You are in trouble. You are not cool enough. You're not good enough. You're not OK unless you get our great product. Now, we don't still make ads like this, but we do make ads like the Whopper Freakout, which is very similar. So in the Whopper Freakout, they put some hidden cameras in, uh, in Burger Kings. And they would, people would come in, you know, sensible adults with their children. They, they're doing OK. And then they're told the Whopper doesn't exist anymore. They can't get a Whopper. And they start to cry. They, thrive, they, they trash the store. They become these babies who are like dead because they can't get their Whopper. So what's the moral of that story? That without our favorite products, we're nothing, right? So the moral of all of these stories becomes to be a good citizen is to be a good consumer. You can define yourself by the products you create, and if you don't, you're going to be a spinster at 30. Um, now, did this actually work? Well, yeah, look at the levels of consumption that exploded when these kind of advertisements came out. Look at how much young people today still define themselves by their brands, by the clothes they wear, by the cars they drive. We created a society that consumes these myths, that loves these myths, and if you ask people, what myths do you live by? They probably would say, I don't live by any myths. But we're exposed to 3,500 commercial messages every day. And we're told by almost all of them, you suck. So you know, I'm not saying that it's time that we all return to the ancient myths of the past, but this is part of the reason we have the society we do today with all the trouble that we're, that we're facing. This is also why becoming a marketer and learning these tools, but using them for good, is a powerful thing that you can do. So let's talk a little bit about our changing time, because I think this offers us hope. What's happening right now in this moment? 
Well, to talk about this moment, we need to go back about 70,000 years to the beginning of human communication as we know it. Um, this is when our first common ancestors uh, began to leave Africa. And we can probably go further back than that. But through, for, in that time, up until the very l smallest sliver of modern times, humans communicated through what's called the oral tradition. That means there wasn't writing. That means there wasn't broadcast tools. Instead, people would give ideas to other people. You'd say them, and someone would listen. Now, this is a survival of the fittest environment, because you don't write stuff down. If an idea is not compelling and interesting, no one passes it around and it dies. Transmission of these ideas moved through social networks and webs. I can't stand up here with a microphone and talk to 300 people. I have to tell someone and hope they tell their friends. Once I give you the idea, it's yours. You can change it, you can make it your own, and in fact, ideas did morph incredibly. And they spread through so many touch points. I can't tell you that you can't say this idea here or you can't say it in this way. I put the idea out and almost like a, a virus or like an organism, it spreads and evolves and changes. This is how the human brain was basically created to consume information and pass it along. Now we know that the oral tradition began to give way to this broadcast era, which turned everything on its head about 100 years ago. So now it's not survival of the fittest anymore. Now we sit on our couches and we watch TV. Instead of me whispering something in your ear, um, it's, it's me being able to broadcast to millions of people if I have the money to do it. And you have almost nothing you can say because you're waiting for your show to start up again or you're stuck on the highway looking at your billboard and you don't get to, you don't get to decide whether you see that or not. Ideas are proprietary. Unlike the old days, I'm not asking you to make this idea your own. And in fact, if you do, I'm going to sue you because that's my idea. And we only have a few controlled touch points. So a marketer, like if you watch Mad Men, once or twice a year, you come up with a new idea, you put it out there, and you don't even really hear back from your customers. You just make these stories and they go out. Now, we all know that this era is coming to a close, right? Survey after survey show that people don't trust broadcast media as much as they trust recommendations from friends and their social networks. People have DVRs. They can skip over ads they don't care about. They can laugh at the advertisements that come their way when they're inauthentic. We are entering a new time, and I call this new time the digital era, because it's really a return to the oral traditions, but it's happening so much faster than it used to. The story of the emperor's new clothes um, got popularized in modern times by Hans Christian Andersen in, uh, in Denmark, but that story began thousands of years earlier in India, but it took that long to get across the continents. Now it can happen in seconds, as with viral video, but otherwise it's back to the oral tradition. If ideas are not compelling, they die, transmissions move through social networks and webs, Everyone owns ideas, they rate them, they comment on them, they mash them up and make them their own. And idea, ideas spread in ways that we can't understand or know or predict. This is a new era, and if you're trying to communicate in this new era, even if you're a broadcaster in this new era, you have to learn to master this new world. And like I said, the old world was pretty bad, so this is a good thing, and I'll show you why. But first we have to ask, what's going to survive in the landscape of our new oral traditions? Now, the old marketing language taught a very specific type of broadcast type uh, communication, where I would stand up and tell you what's what. But what's going to survive out here? Well, we can answer that question pretty easily because we can study oral tradition societies and we can see what has survived. They haven't left us much because they couldn't leave us writing. They left us their trash, the bones and pottery shards, and they left us their stories. The stories that we tell today are still uh, evolutions of those ancient stories. We know storytelling survives in oral tradition societies, and if we want to reach our customers and our advocates and activists, we need to tell great stories, and I want to talk a little bit about how we do that. But first, what is a story? This is a storytelling conference, and I'm glad that I get a chance to define what a story is, um, at least in one definition. Hopefully, some other people will, will come up with their own as well. But here's how I define a story. On the surface of a story, you're going to find your characters, your conflict, your settings, right? It's the visible element of the story. So here's the Wizard of Oz. It's all the stuff that you can see if you're not looking at it with a critical eye. But the storyteller doesn't just randomly place characters and conflict on a stage until he thinks it's funny or interesting or cool. He puts them all there to illustrate a core truth about how the world works. That's the moral of the story, right? And this is, again, why we, why we demand in, as young people to hear stories. We want to learn stories. We want to know how the world works. And so that's a worldview, right? We put every character there to illustrate this core worldview. And if a story doesn't have a worldview, we might often say, I'm not sure what that story was really about. Now, the worldview hides something even a level deeper. And it's a little harder to see, but they're always there. I can tell you a story, 
And that moral might be, he who hesitates is lost. Common moral. And if I tell you that story, you know that I value adventure and risk and reward. I could tell you a different story. Better safe than sorry. That's the moral. Now you know I, I value uh, safety, security. We transmit our values to the stories that we tell and the worldviews that they're encapsulated in. That's the basic of a story, in my mind. So if we think about a brand and all the communications that we create in our modern world, where we have to put out tons of communications, we can't just make that one 30-second spot. What if we think of everything that we say and do out in the world as a story itself? Our brand is a story. And what if we align it around a core truth, something that really matters, something that people say, hey, that's my truth too. I believe that and I want to make that my own. And what if we know the values that we stand for and try to share with our audiences? This is one way that we can start to manage our brand as a story. And it's very different than that broadcast mentality where I just shout facts and figures and tell you how much you suck. And I'll show you a little bit about a new model for how to do that. So first, think about your brand or your cause or your, or, uh, your publication as a, a story unfolding across all of your channels, whether that's the experience your customers are having, your Twitter feed, your Facebook posts, your videos. Now, here's Joseph Campbell, and it's a storytelling conference, of course you need some Joseph Campbell. Um, Joseph Campbell offers us, I think, a great model uh, that many storytellers use for this new oral tradition world that we live in. So Campbell was a scholar in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s who studied myths across time and place. He had this idea that maybe you could find a common template that all cultures used. And, um, you know, it's much debated whether he was exactly right but he did come up with something very compelling. He said, yes, there is a common myth story, and it's called The Hero's Journey. And when George Lucas was really struggling with this space opera he was trying to write that wouldn't come together, he called Joseph Campbell and said, can you help me? And Campbell said, yes, let's write it to The Hero's Journey. And that's where Star Wars was born. So we know in Hollywood, for instance, that this is a very powerful formula. And it can become the basis, I think, for better communication. So how does it work? Well, first it starts out, you've got this helpless outsider trudging through a broken world. So the hero of the hero's journey is not that knight in shining armor who's got all the answers and just kicking ass and beating up the bad guys at the beginning. This is our, uh, our orphan, our slave. Moses was 80 years old when he went to, to free the slaves in Egypt, and he stuttered. Um, this is a hobbit who's only about this tall, someone who's really unlikely to change the world. But they know something's wrong and they want things to be different. And then one day they meet this mentor character. This is like Obi-Wan Kenobi or uh, Gandalf or um, Morpheus or the fairy godmother, right? Um, and who says one thing, basically. So much more is possible. You have a great destiny. Now think about that. The old marketers would tell us, you suck. The hero's journey tells us so much more is possible for ordinary people. It's really different, right? And the... the, and the um, the mentor says, you've got to go on this dangerous quest. And the hero says, no, I don't think so. And then the mentor gives a magic gift. This could be like the lightsaber, the ruby red slippers, the red pill. And says, go ahead, you can do this. And, and then the hero says, OK, great, let's go. And the mentor says, no, 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 I'm not coming with you. Like Obi-Wan Kenobi stands there and says, let's Darth Vader kill him. And then the hero's like, ah, I'm really stuck. But OK, I said I'd do it. So they go. And they confront this dragon, the source of the world's brokenness, the problem, it's the nemesis. And they steal this little treasure when they slay the dragon. So now this hobbit is actually quite powerful. Um, and, but they don't choose to make that treasure the basis of their own coolness. They don't use this treasure to cure their halitosis. They use this treasure to come back and heal that broken world. What Campbell tells us is that these stories that we tell helps each one of us believe that we can be heroes in our own lives. We listen to these stories of ordinary people doing extraordinary things, and not reaping the benefits of great rewards, but making a better society. And we say, hey, that could be me too. Now, why is this embedded in our DNA? Well, isn't a society where young people listen to this story and want to become better citizens, a, a tribe that will hold together better, that will succeed more? It makes sense, right? We want to put aside our selfish egos and become part of something larger than ourselves. So we're programmed to listen to these kind of stories. So how can we use some of these insights, if we think of our brand or cause as a story, how can we use some of these insights to be more empowering to our audiences and to leverage that kind of core DNA human nerve to want to hear stories like this one? 
So I'm going to give you four transformations that can make you a hero in your own journey of communication. But first, I need a sip of water. Okay. So, first of all, the hero of the story. So, the hero of the story, when you tell your story, the hero of the story for your brand is often you, right? We've been in business for this long. We've accomplished these things. We have the best product. We have the best cause. But in the hero's journey story, the hero is always the outsider. The, most per the person least likely to change the world. So what does that mean? Well, here's how broadcast marketing works, and here's broadcast marketing basically brought over to Facebook. So here's a picture of a Dodge, um, and it says, we supply the power. Look how great we are. It makes the brand the hero, and it casts the audience as the consumer. Now think about this for a minute, or let's think about the halitosis ad for a minute. If, you, if you're flipping through your ladies' home journal back in 1940, you look at that ad, you don't really have a choice. You've got to look at it, right? Um, but would you pass that ad onto your social networks? Would you tell all 2,000 of your followers that they have bad breath and they better buy this product? Would that be a good way to build social capital? Of course not. So story engagement really casts the audience as the hero. This is one fundamental and simple, trans uh, simple transformation you can create. It's not about how great your brand or cause is. It's about how great your audiences can be. Nike built this iconic brand Um, whether or not they were completely living it out is another question, but they built this iconic brand not by saying, our sneakers are the best, it'll make achievement easy for you. They said, everything you need is inside of you. Let us help you bring that out. It's the opposite of that inadequacy marketing we were talking about. So lesson one, stop talking so much about yourself and how great you are. Start talking about how great your audiences could be. You're not the hero of your own story. Okay, lesson two. I get this question a lot. Well, if we're not the hero, who are we? Well, there's a great role for you. You're Obi-Wan Kenobi. You're Gandalf. You're the fairy godmother. Um, you're the mentor in the story. Your brand can serve as the mentor. So in the old broadcast marketing, uh, the brand would speak in the voice of God, basically would threaten you. Like, you know, supplies are limited. Come now. Um, and you're like, who's talking to me? But you just had to listen, because, right? So... Um, So we make change mandatory, basically threaten our audiences that you're going to miss this opportunity, you're not going to be okay. Um, that's distracting. Uh, I, I just tell this funny story about, about when God was the mentor in one of these stories. Uh, in the story of Moses, God comes to Moses in the form of the burning bush. And um, he says, go free the slaves in, in Egypt. And Moses knows it's God. And he's still like, no, I'm not doing that because... Who are you? Anyway, he, he says, what's your name is the first question he asks. And God has to like huff and puff and come out of that burning bush and sit with Moses for five days on the mountain because he has to create that human connection. And these great stories are often about that human connection between the mentor and the hero. Without that human connection, there's no story. So stop speaking in this removed voice of God and show your own humanity. And don't order people to change. Show them why they should want to and why it's good for them. Speak in a voice that is uniquely human and unique, unique to you. My son is four years old, and he has already mastered the Yoda voice because it's so different and so cool, and he'll come up to me and say, Dad, wise you must be, and he loves that. Um, I think that's a great way for, to be, for a brand to be. So we use archetyping in our work to say if our brand was a real human being, what kind of human being would we be? And if you come to my practicum tomorrow, I'll show you how to use this archetyping work to really bring out that human character. But audiences expect us now not to be this detached experts, but to actually speak in a human voice. Even for, even for journalists, you know, the Walter Cronkite days are long over. We expect to know who's behind these stories that we're hearing. So lesson two, think about your inner Yoda and stop talking in the voice of God. Okay, so now I said at the heart of stories are values. Um, and it's really important for, for brands and causes to understand what their core values are and communicate around them. I love this, I love, love, love this example, and I want to show it to you for a minute. Um, but first I'll tell you that the guy who first brought modern marketing techniques uh, to advertising, he invented public relations, he invented uh, campaign advertising, and product placement. His name was Edward Bernays, and he was, the, he was the nephew of Sigmund Freud. He actually brought Freud to the Western, to America as well. And he based his ideas on a Freudian notion that human beings are only motivated by things like fear, greed, safety, need for status. And so he built modern marketing in its, in, it, in its early days. And this is kind of an example, right? It goes back to that old thing. This is an artistic dramatization, meaning it's not true, of 
what soap would do to you compared to what Dove will do to you. And I will challenge anybody to retweet this. Because um, this is just stupid. It's not true. And it also makes you feel kind of bad about the product that you're already using. So Dove was using this old kind of thing. Now, Freud wasn't the only one who was thinking about values. Abraham Maslow came along just after Freud and said, Freud, you made a mistake. You thought you knew everything about human beings because you studied a lot of human beings. But the human beings you studied were all sick. That's why they were coming to you. <laughs> so what if we studied human beings who were doing quite well? And Maslow said that human beings, yes, are driven by basic needs, like I need enough food, I need to fit in, I need to feel OK. But also, we're driven by these higher level needs, these, these actualization needs. And actually, they inspire us more. When we speak to these values of community, of self-sacrifice, of creativity, um, of truth and justice, it lights us up even more. And so, so Dove did exactly that. For the digital era, I don't know if you guys have seen this, if it's made it to this part of the world, but this is the most successful YouTube advertisement of all time, like so demanded advertisement of all time, about 150 million views in the first month. Um, they, instead of talking about their soap, started talking about the beauty myth and about how the beauty myth and the media creates un uh, unachievable aims for women and makes them feel bad about themselves. And they created this video in which women would tell a police artist what they looked like, and you could see how low their self-esteem was, and then some stranger would describe them to a police artist, and they would see how much more beautiful they are in other people's eyes. There's no mention of the product, but women pass this around like crazy. Oprah showed this as content for free on her show several times. This lit up the digital landscape because it told a story about higher level values. So think about your brand and your cause and ask, what do we stand for in this world? And can we make them higher level values? In my, in my session, I'll talk a little bit about what those higher level values are and how to harness them. And not just the values that we operate, like teamwork or excellent quality, but things that really matter to people at their deepest level. OK, so the last transformation here uh, is about the moral of the story. Now, a good moral of the story is not, we're the best in the business. A good moral of the story is not, we've been around for 15 years. A good moral of the story that can hold your brand together is a fundamental human truth that someone can say, that's my truth too. So how do you do that? You start to craft a simple statement that every single communication you create will point back to. Just as every character in a well-told story helps to illustrate this core truth, your brand can do the same thing. Sorry. Um, so teach that core compelling truth. Don't tell people something that they already know. Tell something that people say, ah, right. Thanks for reminding me of that. Campbell said that when we hear a great story, it's more like we're remembering than learning for the first time. And I really love that idea, that we are learning something new, but we feel like it was already inside of us. If you could think of that simple statement for your brand and then, and then create all your communications around that, your brand's going to matter. So share something that matters. Um, Charity Water is one of the most successful uh, NGOs or, or nonprofits in raising money. They don't just talk about the science and, the, uh, and, their, and their theory of change and their approach. They tell amazing stories about how clean water affects every aspect of life. And they won't let any communication go out the door that doesn't illustrate this core point. Uh, Patagonia is a brand in the United States that got famous for being an environmental leader and being incredibly uh, engaged in how they make their supply chain more sustainable. But they also stand against consumption. So this ad made them extremely famous and well-known and was very discussed in the advertising world. And it points back to that one core truth that they stand for that life is most enjoyable when you do the least harm. Airbnb is telling a new story. When they first created their, uh, their business, people said, why would you want strangers living in your house? That's dangerous. That's horrible. But with their new Belong Anywhere brand platform, they're letting people know that people are good and trustworthy, and that's their business model. But all their communications point back to that core truth. And there's a lot of people out there who do want to believe that people are good and want to make this story their own. So to go back for one second to what we've learned um, and to wrap up, we all as communicators have to manage a tremendous number of communications. Like I said, gone are the days where you can make that perfect 30 second spot and know that 30 million people will see it and respond to it. 
how do you do that? How do you hold a team of communicators together to build a compelling story from your brand? Well, ask yourself, what is that truth that we stand for? And what are those values that we're seeking to live out every day? Incidentally, as I said, marketing can be a force for good. The more that brands start talking about values, the more that audiences hold them to values, and the more they have to start living out those values. One of the great things about the internet today is that there's these agents, <laughs> these agents of authenticity on the internet. They're out there looking for hypocrisy. They're out there looking to call out those supposedly virtuous brands to show where they're not living up to their values, and those brands have to respond. So the more that brands speak about their values, the more their audiences become part of that conversation and help them live those values out. And in fact, if you talk about your values and then live those values out, that journey to living those values out creates more great stories that you can tell. And then you can think about your brand basically as a story in this five-part very simple model that you can put on a page and you can share with your whole team and work to create. And I believe, as I said, create new myths that help people feel more empowered and more like citizens. You can define the hero of your brand as your audiences, people who have potential to be great, and recognize that people do want to do hard work. They do want to be part of society. They do want to sacrifice. Um, it's not all about convenience and ease. Think of yourself as the mentor. Define that, hu that human voice that gets people to say, yeah, I want to be in relationship with you. Figure out that core truth that you stand for and think of three values, at least one of them being a higher level value. So it's not just about um, safety or security or wealth that you're trying to create and communicate relentlessly around them. And that is the formula, I think, for helping to change this world um, as a piece of it that is so in need of great new stories. And remember, with all of us receiving 3,500 messages a day telling us how much we suck, there's a huge opportunity to create a far better society by creating marketing, communication, and brands that tell us about how great we all can be. And so I explore all of this in my book and with you guys tomorrow. So thank you so much.